All right. So in section three, uh, we're still doing hypothesis testing. It's just now we're going to be looking for the difference between two population means. Now, the process that we learned in video one and video two are still going to be the exact same. So you're going to find your uh, no hypothesis, your alternative hypothesis, your test statistic. You're going to do all that stuff. However, because we're looking at the difference between two population means, our or our uh, null hypothesis is going to be, sorry, right here. So it's going to be mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. In other words, what this is really saying here for this for the uh, null hypothesis is that if I were to take mu2 and just add it to both sides of my equation, then we could say that mu1 equals mu2, which means there is no difference. Between the two populations. So if you think about this, Maybe you're concerned with, uh, let me see here, what's a good example? Like baseball parks <clears throat> and uh, the number of home runs hit per year. May maybe in one park, uh, it's easier to hit, you think it's easier to hit a home run. And uh, maybe in another park, you think it's a little bit more difficult. In other words, the maybe like it's like Boston. I know Boston has a very short field on the left-hand side. It's called the Green Monster. Just Google if you're if you're interested Boston Red Sox Green Monster you'll see what their field looks like it's really really weird but anyways if somebody makes the claim that one field is easier than the other to hit home runs out of you can look over a certain amount of time find the average number of home runs hit per year and test to see if there's a difference between the average number of home runs hit in these baseball parks <clears throat> now if you cannot reject the null then you're going to end up with this situation right here. So if this is if you fail to reject the null, then there is no difference between these two population means, which means there's no difference between these two baseball parks. You just maybe have a bad attitude towards one of the parks. I don't know. It's whatever. But anyways, the alternative hypothesis is still going to be the same. You're going to be less than, greater than, or not equal to. And uh, that is going to dictate what your graph looks like, whether it's left tail, right tail, or two tail. We still have a test statistic. And our test statistic is just a little bit different, okay? Because if you think about it, this zero right here is really just mu1 minus mu2, which equals zero. So we just substitute in zero for that. But if you look here, the test statistic looks familiar. It's just uh, now we're talking about two populations, so we need to adjust a little bit. And finally, for step four, we're going to, you know, find a rejection region, which we know we need a level of significance for that. Uh, we're going to use our graph. We're going to use and then we're going to write a conclusion. This is where if you wanted to also, you can apply the P value method. OK, if you wanted to, which we would use technology for that. <clears throat> and there just is one assumption for here, which is we're going to assume that we have large sample sizes. So N1 and N2 are both going to be greater than or equal to 30. So let's go ahead and let's look at an example here. All right, so here's our example right here. I just I just took this one from the book. It's in the um, exercises part. So the braking ability was compared for two 2018 automobile models. Random samples of 64 automobiles were tested for each type. The re recorded measurement was the distance in feet required to stop when the brakes were applied at 50 miles per hour. And these are the computed sample means and variances. So we got our sample means, we got our variances, which is great. And then we're going to ask the question, do the data uh, provide sufficient evidence to indicate a difference between mean stopping distances for the two models? So what we're interested in, does this data show a difference in the stopping distances? Okay. So like always, step one, we're going to go ahead. We're going to find our null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis here is going to be mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. We're going to assume it equals zero, which means there is no difference, okay? 
Now, oops, sorry, the alternative. Well, this is going to be mu1 minus mu2. Okay, now, if you go back and you read the question real fast, notice I don't see anything along the lines of like the less than or greater than. I just want to know, is there a difference? So, does not equal zero. Okay? Now, step three, we're going to need our test statistic here. Now, remember, the formula, <coughs> excuse me, for the test statistic is going to be a little bit different. Okay? So, uh, let's write out the formula real quick. So, Z is going to equal the mean for sample one minus the mean for sample two minus zero, all divided by the variance for sample one over uh, the sample one size, and then the variance for sample two over the sample two size. So if we go back and we look at the top left-hand side of your screen, you're going to see all the data that's in a nice table for us. So what we can do here is just say Z equals 118 minus 109 minus zero all over the square root of 102 divided by how many 64 automobiles for each over 64 plus 87 over 64 and remember when you type this into your calculator just please be careful okay and I'm coming up with 5.23 okay <clears throat> now we're going to go ahead we're going to draw our graph, we're going to try to label everything that we have. Now, this is a two tail, and that's because of the alternative hypothesis. Um, did they give us, I forget the, uh, let me read it real quick, significance level. All right, so we're going to use alpha equals 0 0.5. So if alpha equals 0, 0 0.05 then that's going to mean plus or minus 1.96 so negative 1.96 and 1.96 now if you need to you can look that up in your chart in your z-score table i'm going to shade in my rejection regions so reject the null reject the null and then in the middle it's going to be fail to reject Okay, and now from here, I think we have enough information. We can label our test statistic. So our test statistic, remember, was 5.23, which means if I look at the horizontal uh, axis, it's definitely going to be inside the rejection region, which now we can go ahead and write like a little conclusion. And I'm going to just keep it real simple here. I'm just going to write reject the null. Okay, now if we can reject the null, remember, the null was mu1 minus mu2 equals 0. So if I reject it, this means there is a difference. Between... the mean stopping distances of the vehicle sampled. Okay? We don't know what that we don't know what that difference is. We just know there is a difference. The data supports the alternative hypothesis that there's something going on here. Now, obviously, you would want to dive down deeper, maybe collect more samples, or maybe start asking different questions. Uh, maybe the two cars are different weights, or maybe the tires were different or something like that. But at the, at the end of the day, 30,000 foot view, there's a difference between the mean stopping distances of the vehicle sampled. Okay, now, if you're wondering how to do this uh, using technology, if you want to, let's say, a p-value, okay? So... There are two ways to go about using the p-value here. We can use technology if we wanted to. 
or we can use our table. Just remember, if you're gonna use your table, you're using the test statistic that you found, which is 5.23, okay? And remember, uh, this, this is symmetric here, our graph. So if you wanted to use the table, what you would have to do, and I can show you real fast, go back to your table. <clears throat> we knew alpha was 0 0.05. We came up with a test statistic of 5.23. And if you look here, it says 3.5 and up. Oops, sorry. You're going to use 0 0.9999. However, you got to be careful here because remember, our graph looked like this, which is a two tail, correct? Now, the table just said 3.5. and up use 0.9999 however like i said you got to be careful because remember the area is taken from left all the way up to right you want that area on the right hand side so you got to use 1 minus 0.9999 which is 0 0.0001 so that is our p value if you're using the table okay so that's why you got to be really careful. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and you can use technology. So for a table, like I said, we came up with 0 0.0001, which obviously is less than 0 0.05. So we would, we would reject the null. Using technology, let's go ahead. Let's look at that. All right, so here we go. So <clears throat> underneath... Uh, you're going to click on inferential statistics and then underneath the procedure selection, you're no longer dealing with one sample. You're dealing with two samples. So you're going to use two sample T. Remember chapter 10, I explained what T means. But as soon as you click on uh, two sample T, notice here we have to type in all the information. You got to be careful because here they went sample standard deviation. And our problem did not give us a sample deviation. They gave us the variance. So what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to take the square root of our number. So if we go back and we look at our table, our sample mean for the first sample was 118. Now for the sample standard deviation, you have to take the square root of 102. The square root of 102 and, and type out all the decimals. 10.09500. The number of samples we had was 64. Now the sample mean for uh, the second sample was 109. We need the square root of 87, which is 9.327379053. And then our sample size here was 64. Notice we want the hypothesis, tech, or, uh, hypothesis checked. And the hypothesized difference is zero. That's from the null hypothesis. Our alternative is not equal to. And we're just going to go ahead and generate results. Notice you got the null hypothesis and the alternative already listed for us. Don't worry about the difference of means. Here's our test statistic that we just calculated, 5.23, which is exactly what we got. And right here is going to be our p-value directly underneath, which is 0 .0000001. And that's because when we use technology, we have more decimal places. The table limits us to basically four. All right. So if we go back into our notes using technology, we came up with 0 0.000001, which is still less than 0 0.05. So we come up with the same exact result, which is going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. And as you can see, even though we had a completely different test, which in, in chapter nine, or I'm sorry, in section two, we were only testing about a population mean, which is one sample. Section three, we're talking about two population means, but the, the approach and the idea is the exact same. That is why hypothesis testing is so important and it's so rigorous, which is uh, it is it is a scientific process on testing a claim. So you could do this 
anytime you want provided you you go ahead and you do your sample of uh, your, your, your data collection of your samples properly and all that good stuff. So uh, I'm going to do one more example here and then and then I'm going to call it a day for, for this video because as you can see here, the process is the same and that's what we're trying to teach you is the process. All right. So let's go ahead. Let's look at one more example. All right. So to determine whether car ownership affects a student's academic achievement, random samples of 100 car owners and 100 non-owners were drawn from the student body. The grade point average for the first sample of 100 non-owners had an average and a variance equal to 2.7 and 0.36. And then uh, sample two is going to be uh, the mean will be 2.5 and the variance is going to be 0 0.40. And that is going to be uh, for 100, own, 100 car owners. Maybe I shouldn't be uh, doing these lectures at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. Do the data present sufficient evidence to indicate a difference in the mean achievements between car owners and non-owners and test using alpha equals 0 0.05. All right. So <clears throat> let's go ahead. Let's do our systematic approach. So step one, the null hypothesis. Mu one minus mu two equals zero. Step two, the alternative. All right. Uh, well, you want to, the question asks, uh, do the data present sufficient evidence to indicate a difference? So the opposite of difference is not different. That's what our null hypothesis is. Therefore, our alternative hypothesis will be not equal to, which means there is a difference. Okay. Step three, let's go ahead and let's find our test statistic. So I need to write out the important pieces of information x bar 1 equals 2.70 and the variance was 0.36 and uh, maybe I you know what I'll write underneath here these are non-owners so these are people that do not own a car and then for the second sample the GPA was 2.54 the sample variance for the second or for the second Sample is 0 0.40, and these are car owners. And for both, N1 equals N2, which equals 100 in terms of sample size. So Z is going to equal X bar 1 minus X bar 2 minus 0 all over the square roots the variance for sample one over its sample size and the variance for sample two over its sample size. So this is going to equal 2.70 minus 2.54 minus zero all over the square root of 0.36 over 100 plus 0 0.40 over 100. So I'm going to get out my calculator and just go ahead and calculate that for us. So this is going to equal 1.84 rounded to two decimal places. So now, part four, this is where everything kind of comes together. Since our alternative hypothesis is not equal to, it's going to be a two-tail. We know alpha equals 0 0.05, so our critical values are going to be negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. This is our reject region. Reject region. In the middle is our fail to reject the null. If I get out my red pen, I'm going to go ahead and label where 1.84 is, and that's going to be actually right here it's going to be inside of the fail to reject region so our conclusion is simple fail to reject the null which means given the sample data there is no difference and what were they asking again i forget 
Uh, do the data present sufficient evidence to indicate a difference in mean achievements between car owners and non-car owners? So I'm just, I'm literally going to copy that down. There is no difference between mean achievements between car owners and non-car owners. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have a car or not. The average GPAs, there's no difference between them. So having a car does not influence your GPA at all. That's what basically this is saying. Because see, at the end of the day, here's what some people may say. And I'll be honest with you. Some people drive me crazy. And they say things like this. I just want to get out my highlighter so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody may say, well, hey, you know, if you don't have a car, that means you're going to stay at home longer, which means you have more time to study. And their average GPA was 2.7. And then on the flip side, somebody will say, yeah, but, you know, people who have a car, obviously they're out doing stuff and they're not home studying and their GPA is lower. It's 2.54. So clearly, if you own a car, you're going to have a lower GPA. Well, the first thing I would say is what proof do you have that even allows you to say that statement. It doesn't make any sense to me. So what do we do? We go ahead, we collect 100 non-owners and 100 car owners. We figure out their uh, sample statistics and we actually do a test for hypothesis. And in this case, it's going to be the difference of two means. And what we've concluded is that there is no difference in mean achievements. So if you think about this, if you were just a fly on the wall, you have two situations here. The first situation, two people or, or one person's making a claim that car owners have lower GPAs and that's it. That's all they say. They have no evidence to back them up. Situation two, you actually have somebody who said, okay, well, I'm going to test your claim. They went out, collected the data. Here's the results. Who are you, who are you more likely to believe? The one who has zero evidence to back up their claim or the one who actually has evidence to back up their claim, okay? So that's going to be it for this, uh, for, for this, I guess, uh, lecture, this video. Hypothesis testing is really fun. It's really easy. It's just a matter of understanding what test are you going to apply to the situation. And to be honest with you, it all comes down to the question that is being asked. If you if you are comparing two populations and you're going to do this, if you are just looking at one population, then you do the techniques that we learned in chapter, or I'm sorry, in section two. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm just going to show you something real fast, which is uh, this is going to be our book. So let me see. Let me click this. All right, so here we go. And I'm going to zoom in so we can see this here because... Chapter nine is unbelievably important because it, it, it gives us the foundation for hypothesis testing. OK, now, if you look at chapter 10, inference from small samples, but it's going to be the same exact thing, which is we're going to be doing hypothesis testing, however, using small samples now. So if we go ahead and click on this and I just scroll down a little bit right here, section one is the student T distribution. We're going to be getting another table. However, the hypothesis testing uh, technique does not change when we get into simple linear regression and correlation. Um, once again, it's a different thing. However, if you look at section 12.3, testing the usefulness of linear regression, we're going to be using hypothesis testing again for linear regression. In fact, uh, you can click on pretty much any one of these chapters, even an uh, analysis of variance, ANOVA testing, and it's going to be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to be ranking population means. We're still going to be looking at the difference between means. It's just in section 11.3, you're looking at uh, instead of two means, two population means, maybe you're looking at four, five, or six population means, okay? And then finally, uh, let me see here. In analysis of categorical data, uh, contingency tables, it's still the same exact thing. You're going to be doing hypothesis testing. However, now you're looking at uh, frequency counts within a contingency table. So I don't want to scare you or anything like that. 
Uh, some of this stuff, we're, we're, we're going to do some of it. We don't like the non-parametric uh, statistics. We're not going to do that in this class, okay? Uh, however, chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 are all hypothesis testing. And the process is still the same. So I just want to go ahead back into our notes because I want us to look at it real quick, all right? Before we end this video, so I'll go back to section two because that's where this is all about. Where is it to begin? Oh, it's right here. Step one, you always want to identify the null hypothesis. Step two, you're going to want to identify your your uh, alternative hypothesis. Step three, you're going to want to calculate your test statistic. Step four, you want to go ahead and label your rejection region, your conclusion. You're going to have to draw like a little graph if, if you're using the classical approach. If you're using the p-value method, you, you don't have to do any of this. Okay. Personally, I like the classical approach because I can see it. I'm, a, I'm more of a visual learner um, versus just all abstract. And then step five, if there is a step five, sometimes I do a step five, but it doesn't matter, which is just want to label your conclusion, which is going to be one of two answers. Reject the null or fail to reject the null. And then kind of write a sentence that summarizes what just happened here. For example, like in our last example that we looked at. We failed to reject the null, and then I just wrote a statement. Given the sample, oh, I forgot the word data. Stupid me, I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and just put the word data in there. Given the sample data, there is no difference in mean achievements between car owners and non-car owners. Just write a statement that summarizes everything we just spoke about. And uh, that's it for chapter nine. So it's very important that we understand the process on hypothesis testing. Good luck. If you've got any questions, you know where to find me. I'll talk to you later.